Um, my name is Betsy Hansen. I was a summer fellow uh, many years ago now, and I had the great pleasure of getting to know both Tom and Bob over the summer. And the summer fellowship experience is extremely unique, and I cannot tell you how grateful I am for that experience because you're working with individuals that are so passionate about what they do and will talk for hours about what they've been studying. And it's a really rare experience to have that. Um, so I have all the supporters of the Institute to thank for that and um, really appreciate everyone coming here today. It's a lot more people than I expected and it's a very pleasant surprise. So um, let me move on without delay. Um, Bob Murphy is an associate scholar at the Mises Institute and a former Mises fellow himself a number of years ago. Um, he's currently a research assistant professor at Texas, Texas Tech University and a research fellow at the Independent Institute. And he's also president of consulting at RPM and runs the free, um, free advice blog um, online, and it's highly entertaining. I totally recommend it. He's also a co-host of The Contra Krugman Show and has recently come out with a book entitled Choice, Cooperation, Enterprise, and Human Action, and you guys can all buy it downstairs if you like. And Tom Woods, who is about to make a dramatic um, entrance up here, uh, is, he is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, and he was also a former summer fellow at the Institute. And he's a New York Bet Times bestseller of, believe it or not, 12 books. And he's created an extensive line of courses for the Ron Paul Homeschool website. He also um, hosts a daily show called The Tom Woods Show. And it comes out every day at tomwoods.com. And also co-hosts The Contra Krugman Show. So busy fellas, very impressive resumes. You can read a lot more online. but. I will stop it at that and let you guys go. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Betsy, for that introduction. Tom, of course, the diva, who has to wait off stage and then come up as he's introduced. Um, and I, I think I speak for Walter Block as well, for those of you who are downstairs with the autographing, that it's always a pleasure to come out to Seattle so Walter and I can watch people ask Tom for his autograph. That's always... Uh, what I long to get on a plane for. Um, so thank you all for coming here. As Betsy mentioned, in all seriousness, I also was a, a summer fellow at the Mises Institute. And in truth, I, I really do encourage people who are around the world, if, uh, you know, getting a PhD is ideally the kind of person they want. It doesn't have to just be in economics, but in some field where you're going to be using uh, the Austrian school in your, in your work, that's the kind of person uh, we want to apply for the program. And it's, it really is, as Betsy said, uh, an area where you just, you just go, I went there just to give you the background. So I was at NYU getting my PhD in economics. The first summer, I, I just worked at a, like a temp job, you know, just to, to raise money. Because at, at NYU, you know, they gave me a fellowship, but it wasn't enough to pay for. I just recently paid off all my student loans, you know, just for the, the standard of living there. It was, it was kind of just, oh, thank you. Are we, pl are we plotting that? Yeah. <laughs> You know, so I'm not like Trump. I didn't just, I didn't just, you know, walk away. You know, I paid off those loans. Um, yeah, I don't want those bankers holding that over me the rest of my life. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so it's, it was very good. So the first summer that I, I came across, I think it was just, I was reading Justin Romando at Antiwar. He mentioned LouRockwell.com. I went there. Then I heard about this thing called the Mies Institute. And I went down there the first summer for a fellowship. So I guess it was my second year in grad school. And I'm not kidding. I honestly thought I was going to be like, getting Lou Rockwell coffee every day. Like, that's what I thought I was going to be doing. And so I show up, and they're like, so what's your research going to be this summer? And I, I don't know, coffee beans? You know, I don't, I don't know, you know, the kind of tie he wants me to put out in the morning, but I don't know, you know. And I was astonished that, no, you, you go there, and they just have a whole library, and you study Austrian economics all summer, and there's other experts from around the world. So, again, it's a, it's a tremendous program, and we, of course, thank those of you who are responsible both here and, and who are perhaps watching this later on for your, for your funding to make that possible. So another uh, thing I, sh I should mention is I have been doing these events with Walter for a while, and he routinely refers to himself when he was younger as a stud. And I had always assumed he was taking dramatic liberties with that, but did you guys actually look at this? 
I mean, he really is a stud. I'm being serious. I mean, don't, if you don't do it now, like we'll listen to our show, but I'm just saying later, look at this. I, they didn't put his address, I, his home address here where they have everyone else. I think it's because they didn't want the ladies just like around, hey, Walter, hi, you know, peeking into his curtains. The other thing, he used to say too, I've seen him give that talk a lot, the minimum wage, and you say how when he was younger, he would jump over this. This is tall, all right? I don't know, I mean, I'm sure when I was 19, I physically could have jumped over this, but I wouldn't have done it in front of a crowd, right? And so, but now looking at his track picture, I mean, he might have been able to do it. All right, this is impressive. All right, so I have to, one more sort of housekeeping announcement. There's this flyer for the Contra Cruise that's down there. Yes, thank you. Some of you have already signed up for it, and you've, you've chosen wisely. The rest of you, just a matter of getting your checkbooks out. And we also accept major credit cards. And I w- just want to encourage you, this has to do with, for those who don't listen to the show, this is a, an outgrowth of the Contra Crewman podcast, which I will explain in a moment. And the flyers are all downstairs, so we encourage you uh, to make sure you catch one of these things. It's going to be October 9th through 16th, 2016. It's a week-long cruise. It's we're going to, we're departing from Galveston. D- during the, the at-sea days, we're going to have all sorts of fun and games planned. You might even learn something here or there having to do with Austrian economics and libertarianism. And then we're going to go to Honduras, two stops in Mexico, and then we're back in Galveston later. And if President Trump does build that wall, we will be back safely before the wall is enacted. Just some people were, were worried about that. Okay, so I am here to formally introduce the Contra Krugman podcast, which you see the, the slide up there. I know many of you know what it is, but for those who don't, so Tom called me this, what was it, like last September that you called me with that, that fateful call? And, and he's, I'm not kidding, the way he started the call is he goes, okay, Bob, I want to have an, I have an idea, I'm going to pitch it to you, and you cannot say no until you give me four minutes. And I said, okay, and he started out and said, we're going to start a podcast where we take apart Paul Krugman's column every week. And honestly, my initial reaction was, no, Tom, we can't do that because then we'll be pigeonholed and it will look like Krugman is the big man and we're just always nipping at his heels. And just the longer he talked, the more he convinced me. And the number one reason was just to say how many people would really enjoy that this podcast exists and you know, how, how could we turn away from the consumers, you know, the consumer sovereignty. Uh, and, and I mean, this, I'm not, this isn't a joke. I, I recently realized just the, the depths of, of hatred of Paul Krugman. I went over to Europe, uh, I'm with Texas Tech, and we have a, a sister program over there, what they call the European Free Market Roadshow, and so they sent me over there touring, and in every city in Eastern Europe that I went to, people would come up, and the first thing out of their mouths was, we love Contra Krugman, we can't stand that guy, right? <laughs> and they were talking about Krugman, not Tom Woods, right? So, <laughs> so what, the, what, what it is, the show is every week we pick Paul, one of Paul Krugman's op-eds, and then we, we go through and, and dissect it, and the point is to entertain, but also to teach uh, Austrian economics and libertarian political theory. This week, we were actually concerned uh, because as of Thursday, you know, the, the, the columns we had to choose from were not particularly great for, for this purpose, and we were thinking we should go into if we go a blog post, and then Krugman just delivered. He gave us a gift from heaven, as it were. His op-ed yesterday was just perfect for this, as you'll see in a minute, just exactly what we want, sort of the greatest hits of, uh, you know, economic ignorance from a, from a Keynesian perspective. <laughs> Could not, I, I almost think that he, he must listen to the show and realize that, oh, they're gonna be in Seattle doing this live, I gotta give him, throw him a bone, you know. <laughs> Maybe Bernie called him and said, yeah, my old high school buddy's gonna be there, can you just, you know. <laughs> So the last thing I will mention is, of course, so what we're doing is we are taping this, you know, this is going to, this is going to live stream, but we're recording this, so what we're going to release for this week's episode is what you guys are going to see here, or here, here, and uh, I, we're, we're a little bit, you know, a little bit hesitant, we're like, you know, we normally have a good banner going on and whatever, but it's going to be kind of weird with hundreds of people watching us. But then I relaxed. I said, you know what? We've proven ourselves. We have dozens of episodes out there that are phenomenal. So we know that Tom and I can do it. So if this episode's a flop, it's on you guys. All right, with that. Welcome to the podcast that takes apart Paul Krugman's New York Times column. Join us as Tom Woods and Bob Murphy teach economics by uncovering and dissecting the arrows of Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, newspaper columnist, and destroyer of nations. It's time for Contra Krugman. Hello, everybody. I'm Tom Woods with Bob Murphy here for episode 36 of Contra Krugman. For the first time ever, recorded before a live audience here in Seattle. (laughs) 
I don't know about you, Bob, but I like Seattle. Yeah, Seattle's great. I love yeah, it. We okay. should get one of those things say, applause, applause. <laughs> Today's show notes page will be ContraKrugman.com slash 36, where we will be linking, as we always do, to the Krugman column that we're talking about, and then to the various refutations that we've found. And, of course, the whole episode is an audio refutation. We're talking today about the Krugman column, from, as Bob said, from just yesterday. It's the May 20th, 2016 column. It's called Obama's War on Inequality. So this one, as Bob says, is just dripping with inanities. So it's perfect, just perfect for what we were looking for. Now, we did, I will say, we did consider for a time having everybody get a copy of the column so that you could follow along with us. So we thought of putting copies on all the seats and whatever. But then we thought, I'm stealing your joke, Bob. Then we thought, if this is your first Mises event and you show up and there's a Krugman column in the seat, you might get confused. Yeah, they might think, oh, they're trying to make it for a Seattle crowd. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's right. That's right. So instead, we don't actually bring the thing we're talking about, but we do bring a flyer about our cruise that we hope you'll join us on. So our priorities are where they, they ought to be. All right, so the way the podcast works is I start off by summarizing the Krugman column. I'm sort of the straight man to Bob's genius over here. So I summarize the Krugman column, and then we just sort of go back and forth, and occasionally we get little digs in at each other. Like, I think I was trying to, I don't know if it was trying to teach comparative advantage or what, but I was saying, you know, I suppose Bob is a really, uh, you know, good golfer but a lousy chess player. And I said, now, of course, this is hypothetical because we all know Bob's a lousy golfer and chess player. So we have these fun little goofy back and forth. We, you know, these are all unrehearsed. So here we go. I'm going to go through the column for you and uh, pull out the highlights, and then we will go to town on this baby. So we begin here with, uh, and it is a greatest hits column, really, because we begin with a discussion of financial reform and Dodd-Frank. Now, we've closed the doors. I know people would want to leave when they hear Dodd-Frank. How could this be interesting? It is, so sit, stay sitting. It is interesting. He says that it just goes to show how out of touch Donald Trump is that he wants to do away with Dodd-Frank, the key measure of financial reform. And he says, you know, even though Trump is called a populist, almost every substantive policy he has announced would make the rich richer at workers' expense. So he thinks that Dodd-Frank is really, really keeping an eye on those big financial institutions. Well, we're going to talk about that, of course, in a little while. Then he's talking about the new Obama administration guidelines regarding overtime pay. And he says that also has been, uh, that's a great step forward that we've had. That and Dodd-Frank are two great Obama initiatives. So we'll be talking about those. So you see, I don't refute them as I go along. I'm the impartial observer. I'm just, I'm just summarizing the column. But now we're, but we're sharpening our fangs as we do this. we got the sharpener going. And he says, now what are the sorts of things that the federal government can do to limit inequality? Well, of course, it can simply redistribute incomes, you know, take from the rich and give to the poor, that sort of thing. It can also do what's called pre-distribution, which, and here's, I'm, I'm quoting Krugman, strengthening the bargaining power of lower paid workers and limiting the opportunities for a handful of people to make giant sums. So that's, that's so-called pre-distribution. And he says, we, we did this in our own society. During the New Deal, for example, we had pro-labor legislation that led to a, an expansion in labor unionism. And that, coupled with a fairly high minimum wage, helped raise wages, especially at the bottom. And then taxes on the wealthy went up sharply, and these were all positive things, according to Krugman. And then Krugman goes on and says, and by the way, Denmark's a great example of a government that's very active, and there's a large public sector, and there's a lot of public spending, and it's doing the sorts of things I'd like to see done. So we're calling this a greatest hits thing, because we did a whole episode on Denmark because of Krugman, and here's old Denmark coming back up again, you know, just like just an old-fashioned love song by Three Dog Night or something. It comes right back up for you. All right, then finally... He talks about Obamacare. Come on, Obamacare. This is subsidies mainly to lower income Americans. And it's partly paid for by taxes on the, on the wealthiest. So again, this is great. It's going to help reduce inequality. And then he says now, and then he returns to Dodd-Frank and says, look, the bankers are howling over it, so it must be good. It really is stopping them from uh, earning money hand over fist. So by the end, he says, look, I know some cynics think it doesn't matter who gets elected. 
And by the way, in order to understand his climax here, let's put in parentheses, he wants to be in the Hillary Clinton administration. So practically every column is a sappy, dripping love letter to Hillary Clinton. And so here he says, but it's not true that both parties are the same. They're so different. Oh, they're so different. Because if we got, if we got the Republicans, we know terrible things would happen. But it's the Democrats who will do the right thing and who actually have the IQ and the intelligence to follow an economic argument. Oh, rumbling in the room. Well, then I have done my job well. That is the Krugman column for May 20th, 2016. Bob, I'm actually going to start off, if you don't mind, because I'll throw it over to you for the overtime pay stuff. But this whole Dodd-Frank thing, that's a greatest hit because we did talk about Dodd-Frank in a previous episode a little bit. But it turns out that you'll never believe there was a major regulation that disproportionately harmed smaller institutions at the expense, you know, so that smaller institutions bear the largest burden and larger institutions more or less coast by. I mean, I know you'll never believe they did something like that, but it turns out, according to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, which is not known for you know, being anti-establishment, the Kennedy School of Government did a study that found that since the second quarter of 2010, which is right around the time Dodd-Frank was passed, community banks, your local small bank, their share of U.S. banking assets has fallen drastically right, around, right at the same time. And this is not a coincidence. The reason is the compliance officers you have to hire, the, the burden of complying with the regulation is extremely difficult on these smaller institutions. And as it turns out, where are small businesses getting the credit they need for their businesses? Well, from the small community banks. Big businesses can get the, the influx they need from the capital markets. But the small businesses rely on those community banks. Now, if those community banks are suddenly under a tremendous amount of pressure financially because of Dodd-Frank, they can't extend the loans. And if they can't extend the loans, then the small businesses suffer. Well, when we look at job growth starting 2002 and going up to Dodd-Frank, a whole lot of it is coming from small business. But then after Dodd-Frank, that source of new job creation basically dries up. And so, in fact, you see a divergence between larger firms in terms of their job growth and job growth in, in uh, small businesses right around the time that Dodd-Frank begins pummeling your community bank. And yet Krugman says, Dodd-Frank is really going to, if you want to get rid of Dodd-Frank, that means you want to help the big, the big banks. The big banks are being quite helped by this current arrangement. So Krugman, it turns out, is wrong on the first point of his column. But Bob, is he maybe right? Does he redeem himself with the overtime pay discussion? I'm glad you asked that, Tom. Yeah, right. No, he doesn't, actually. <laughs> it's right. funny, as we're sitting here, because remember, folks who are listening to this at home, we are doing this in front of a live audience, and so something felt odd to me, and I couldn't put... I realized what it was normally when Tom's going through and summarizing Krugman's column. I'm checking my Twitter feed, and I can't really do that uh, with you guys all staring at me. <laughs> It'd be awkward. So, uh, the one thing I want to do point out, though, is that the, just the title itself. Now, by the way, people should know, if you write an op-ed for an outlet, it, it's possible they give you a title, right? So don't ever get mad at somebody and send an email and bite someone's head off because of the, the title. They might not have any influence. But I think here this is a fair one. Again, just Obama's war on inequality. I just want to point out that it is perverse that in American culture, when you want to deal with some social issue, the war metaphor is always there. And you see it also when they talk about the Federal Reserve. What is the thing they always say, what Bernanke was saying and yelling? Don't worry, the Fed's not out of ammunition yet. We can keep shooting stuff at the U.S. economy until we blow it up. Don't worry. You know, it's, we still have more, you know, powder, dry powder. Uh, it's, w one last thing, too, about the Dodd-Frank stuff. Remember, folks, do you remember, like, there was the, the Enron and Tyco scandals in the early 2000s, right? And they passed Sarbanes-Oxley, George W. Bush signing that, was bragging how it was one of the biggest overhaul, I think he said the biggest overhaul of the financial sector since the New Deal. And he was saying, you know, the age of corporate malfeasance and, and falsifying profits is over. Remember how like, the last falsified corporate profit happened in like 2004? Remember, you guys remember that? <laughs> um, what, no history majors in here? Come on. Uh, and so again, it just, I just, everything about that's wonderful. Number one, George W. Bush is not 
you know, this anarcho-capitalist hero, right? We can go check the roster. I don't think he was ever a Mises Summer Fellow. I, I don't think uh, he was there. And so this idea and also this notion that all oh, the Bush administration rolled back financial regulation. Thank goodness we have Obama at the helm to come in with, with Dodd-Frank to finally clean up Wall Street. Every time there's a huge scandal, they always pass new legislation, tightening up things, it's promising, okay, that won't happen again. You know, now, thank goodness, because if, if you want to make sure that people on Wall Street play by the rules and don't steal money, clearly you have to get Washington involved, because those guys, if they're not known for anything, it's uh, being truthful and good with money. Uh, but let's, yeah, as you say, Tom, let me focus on the, one of the main elements of this column where he's talking, the, the reason we're supposed to be happy about the Obama administration and not listen to the cynics, and Tom is right that it's, it's not merely right-wing people attacking. Really what Krugman is doing here is more aiming this towards leftist progressives who are fans of Bernie Sanders, and he's trying to show them why you should support Hillary even though she's taking all this money for giving speeches and stuff you know, to Goldman Sachs or whatever you know, for her wonderful oratorical abilities. That's clearly why she's getting paid such top dollar. And so that's, that's the, the function of this column. You just make sure you understand that. But the specific thing he's pointing to is the Department of Labor recently came out. They issued a final rule, and I'm going to summarize it very uh, loosely. The idea is you know how people... If they, normal workers, there's first of all the minimum wage, but then there's also rules on getting time and a half, right? If you work overtime, you work over 40 hours, you got to get paid 1.5 times your base salary for those, that excess. But that, those regulations don't apply to every single worker. They're exemptions for what you might call white collar workers. And so recently the rules have been tweaked such that now millions more people are going to fall under, under the, that jurisdiction of, of that particular act. And so the way Krugman summarizes it, he says, the Obama administration issued new guidelines on overtime pay, which will benefit an estimated 12.5 million workers. So first of all, I, I want to quote uh, Don Boudreau. He wrote a, a letter to the New York Times complaining about this column, and he said, Paul Krugman, sadly, no longer even pretends to reason like an economist. He instead reasons as if he's a 19-year-old cultural studies major, right? <laughs> and it's a great, great line, and... And I, what Boudreaux means there is often Krugman will come up with some specious argument, like he'll build an economic model to justify whatever the thing he's talking about. So, for example, with the minimum wage, for those here in Seattle Live, you saw Walter Block walk through the standard deductive, you know, Austrian textbook thing about the minimum wage. And that's even was in Paul Krugman's textbook, believe it or not, recently. And they can come up with arguments as to why, oh, actually now if you raise the minimum wage modestly, it won't have these huge impacts on employment that we used to, and they can come up with reasons why they think that might be true. Krugman doesn't even try to do that here, and he links, to where he gets that figure about the workers that would be benefited, he linked to some EPI study, which is a very, very progressive pro-labor pro uh, outlet, and I went through and read their, their press release, I clicked open their, their methodology. I did not see anybody even bring up the fact that, hey, if you now... Uh, say that employers have to pay workers 50% more for these hours that are above 40, they might purchase fewer hours. Okay, so now we've gotten to the point where they don't even give a nod to the fact that making something 50% more expensive might make the buyers of that thing want to reduce the, the purchasing power, or purchases of it. So that, that's just astonishing that they don't even, you could say there's pros and cons and the pros, I would, but they don't even bother bringing that. It's just very naive. You want to help workers pass this measure that, that increases their pay by 50% on these hours and boom, count up how many people that affects and those are the people benefited by this and who could possibly object except right-wing Neanderthals. Uh, one more point on this, Tom, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you. And I get this fruit from Boudreaux. He's saying that, just think about it. They're, the way they're couching this and describing it is to say that there's these, all these workers out there, and they're in an inferior bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis their employers, so we're going to help them by now making it illegal for the employers to refrain from paying them time and a half, right? So now they have to pay time and a half. And so Boudreaux was saying, in general, if two people are bargaining and you take away options from one of the people, how are you strengthening their bargaining position, okay? So let me paraphrase it. Forget overtime, babe, just in general. Suppose you're, you know, you're somebody, you're sitting down with a potential employer and you're negotiating over your strategy. So normally what happens is you throw out a number, they throw out a lower number, then you counter offer and you go back and forth and you might meet somewhere. What if they passed a law that just said, from now on, if you're negotiating with an employer for a new job, the first number you throw out, it is illegal for them to pay you less than that number. 
You are not allowed, if they give you a lower one, to then come, you know, you have to just give that number, say, take it or leave it, and if they say no, you got to walk out and you can't work for that company anymore because we're going to strengthen your bargaining position. Because if we gave you the option to be able to then, if they undercut it, and, you know, and then you came back and you ended up signing a contract for a lower number than the one you first threw out, well then, you know, clearly they're going to take advantage of you if they know they have the option of giving a lower number. So that's how we're going to help million, I mean, that would help 300 million workers, right? Because right now it's legal for everybody to throw out a number and then settle for something less. So, I mean, beyond the absurdity of it, like how is that going to help workers by taking away options and surely, you know, just think through the logic. What in practice would happen everybody would realize, okay, now the worker is going to throw out a lower initial number if he or she knows I have to you know, stick to my guns on that number. So it's not going to make them, there's no reason to suppose in general workers would be getting paid more if that was the crazy new rule. So likewise with the minimum, or sorry, with the uh, overtime pay regulations, what's the obvious thing that's going to happen once things adjust is now when workers are bargaining and they're white collar workers who traditionally wouldn't have been affected by this rule, their base pay is going to be lower than it used to be because now the employer knows if I want to have them work more than 40 hours, I got to pay 1.5 times that. And of course, the other thing is fewer people now are going to be able to work more than 40 hours a week. So it's perverse right when we're wringing our hands and lamenting, how come people, you know, they're underemployed and now we're going to come in and say, if you want to work more than full time, we're going to make it 50% more expensive. It's and, and not even bringing that up, not even coming with some crazy argument as to why that doesn't apply here because we're in a liquidity trap or something. He doesn't even bother bringing that up. All right, I'm going to talk about inequality in general. <clears throat> and of course, given this is episode 36, you can be sure we've done an entire episode on inequality. It's one of my favorite episodes of the whole show. So I'm just going to go give you a few, a few facts that I think will help clarify this debate a bit. But bear in mind, we did like a, you know, we try to keep it to 30 minutes, but that we never were able to do that. So this Inequality one is like 55 minutes. So I got 55 minutes worth of this. Here's your two-minute encapsulation of that. When you're looking at these statistics related to inequality, so, you know, rich and poor, and there's vast inequality between super rich and the super poor, a lot of, these, uh, a lot of the examinations of this data take place by looking at the different quintiles of the income distribution. So, uh, Quintiles are fifths, so there's the lowest fifth, the second to lowest, the middle, and then all the way up to the top fifth. And they act as if these people in the lowest 20%, they say, oh, look at what's going on with people's income in the lowest 20%. They act like these are the same people over the course of, a, of 50 years, but they're not. No, almost nobody stays in the bottom 20% over the course of 50 years. Basically nobody. So if you're studying the, the fortunes of the 20, lowest 20% over 50 years, you have to realize you're looking at different people. Most people have already left that thing. So it's much more interesting to look at what, what exactly is the trend among individual people, not, not categories of people, but where's, where's Joe Smith who started off in the lowest 20%? Where's he? And it turns out that 16 years later, 95% of the people in the bottom quintile are no longer there. Twenty-six percent have gone all the way to the top twenty percent. Then when we think about the top ten percent of income earners, top ten percent, there's an elite group, but yet over the course of their lives, fifty-six percent of Americans at one time or another will be in the top ten percent. Now that is probably more income mobility than they had in, say, I don't know, the year 1700, 1600, 1500, 1400, ever? That's probably the most we've ever seen. Also, most of the households in the bottom 20% of income earners have nobody working in them. There's a slight hint as to what may be going on there. There are more heads of households working full-time and year-round in the top 5% than in the bottom 20 then let's look at households headed by a 25-year-old. Households headed by a 25-year-old, 13% of those at one time or another have been in the top quintile. But then you look at households headed by a 60-year-old, and 73% of those have been in the top 20%. And then, then you realize, well, wait a minute, a lot of this has to do with age. Turns out if you're 60, you earn more than when you're 19. How about that? And since most people who are 60 were also at one time 19, 
Over the course of a normal human lifespan, this all works out. It all works out. You're not stuck in some category where, well, I, you know, I'm never going to have a chance of rising. Just wait. You get older, you have a much, much better chance. You're age 60, you have a 73% chance of having hit at one time in your life or another the top quintile in incomes. Again, compare that to any time or place in world history, I would say it comes out pretty well. And this is under a, a highly hampered market economy. Then finally, compare free countries to less free countries. Okay, I mean, this is a rough estimate trying to compare the economic freedom of one country to another, but let's suppose, all right, we, we take the countries that are obviously the freest, um, and we, we divide, let's say we take all the countries in the world, we divide them into four groups, like the freest and the second to freest, and, the, and the, now you're getting really not free, and then the worst, the least free. And it turns out, if you look at the least free countries, and you look at what do the poor earn in the least free countries, the bottom 10%, they earn in 2011 dollars $932 a year. The, the lowest 10% on average earn $932 a year in the least free countries. In the most free countries, the bottom 10% earn $10,556 per year. Now, even if, by the way, it turns out that the most free countries also have less inequality, oddly enough. But, it, but even if there weren't, if you were poor, but you were much closer to the rich, would you want to live in the least free countries and say, well, I'm, I'm only earning $930 a year, and I'm, you know, I'm crawling around looking for worms and berries in the dirt, but at least the rich only earn $1,200 a year, so I'm sticking it to them. <laughs> who would care? Who, would, who in his right mind would be that full of envy that you would even care? Whereas even if, even if in the U.S. you were earning ten five, and you knew the rich guy was earning $2 million, what difference does that make? You don't have to eat worms. Like, that's something. Why does that not count? All right, Bob, what else do you, you have to say anything about worms? Yeah. <laughs> now, Tom, you, you talked about countries that were not free. You know what else is not free? The, the Contra Cruise. The Contra Cruise. <laughs> no one eats worms on the Contra Cruise. No, sir. <laughs> and that's why we have to charge you a little bit, but it's not too expensive. By the way, can I, can I just interject? I mean, of course, the jokes aren't funny when they are explained. Well, they're not funny if they're told by Bob, but hey. then they have to be explained. <laughs> but half the fun of the show is making completely ridiculous, awkward segues into promoting our cruise. So that was classic. That was good, Bob. Good. Well done. Yeah, I like to partner with Tom because he explains my jokes to people, and I can just sit back, sort of like... That, that was a mistake Andy Kaufman He needed to have a straight man. Um, let me yeah, mention, what's funny too, though, is the way Krugman talks about this. He says, among advanced countries, the U.S. has the highest level of inequality, Denmark the lowest. So that phrase, among advanced countries, I think partly the reason he... he, he in Krugman's mind, he's thinking, oh, because I want to make it a, a valid comparison, and we're just... A, but part of the reason, too, is the U.S. certainly isn't the lowest in terms of their inequality, Gini coefficients or whatever, of all countries in the world or especially over world history. So in a very legitimate sense, like communist countries where totalitarian states, there's clearly differences between the, the type of people who are politically connected and the average masses, right? And so, it, again, it just shows you that by giving the state more power, that's certainly not a guarantee that you're going to have a quality of outcome in the sense of things that w of what people actually care about. Surely society was much more unequal in terms of classes of people in the old Soviet Union than compared to the United States today, for example. Uh, let me also mention, uh, Tom, just very quickly, I've, we've talked about this before, but he's got a line in here about, he says, most obviously Obamacare provides aid and subsidies mainly to lower income working Americans, and it pays for that aid partly with higher taxes at the top. Now, for one thing in there, the uh, Kaiser uh, F Family Foundation recently came out with this, this piece. It was just like la last week on Obamacare and how you guys aren't going to believe this, but Americans do not like buying health insurance. They find the process distasteful. They don't like it. They would rather go buy like color TVs or something. And so, and so this Kaiser, and this, if you don't know, the Kaiser Family Foundation is totally in the tank for Obama. Like they're very much in favor of the Affordable Care Act. And so they're trying to understand, you know, why is it that people don't like this? And it turns out it's because they don't feel they're getting good value for their purchase. You know, so it's kind of odd that the government comes along, forces insurance companies 
to sell products to people they're going to lose money on, and then the companies try to make the product not that attractive. It's, it's an odd thing. I, I don't know. There should be like a, a course you could study in college that would teach these sorts of things to, to understand it. Maybe a course starting with an E and ending with nomics. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, another thing on that, just so you guys understand, it's let me just very just give you one example of what these health insurance companies, and all this was predictable, and in fact, many people did predict it, many free market economists like uh, John Goodman and so forth, and the book Primal Prescription I have uh, with Doug McGuff, we talk about some of this, but to give you an example of the kind of the way this thing works, let's say you're a health insurance company. It is now, if somebody who has cancer comes up and applies for a policy legally, you can't turn the person away. You know you're going to lose money, and you can't charge a person a lot more either, right? You can't say, well, you're going to cost us tens of thousands of dollars in treatment, so we're going to, you can't do that. It's illegal. So what do you do? You either go out of business, or what you do is you tell your people, okay, figure out, you know, where we are in the marketplace, the kinds of people who are going to apply, figure out in this area, who are the best cancer doctors? Okay, you, you got their names? Yep. Make sure they're out of network for all of our plans, right? And so that way, somebody who actually has cancer and thinks, oh, thank goodness, President Obama made sure, you know, these tight-fisted insurance companies can't turn me away, and now they, oh, they sign up everything, they sign up, and they, oh, great, I got coverage now, thank goodness, and now the doctors that all the experts tell them, these are the ones you got to go to for your condition, these are the best doctors, they're out of network, you know, so th that sort of thing happens, and they're not, unless they're trained in economics or free market, you know, fans who go to Mises.org and so forth, who are they going to get mad at? They're going to get mad at the insurance company. Like, how dare you? You guys must know that these are not the best cancer doctors. Why aren't they in network? And so this is going to just lead to people being outraged and then down the road demand single payer. And the politicians at that time are going to say, well, we gave the free market a chance. Didn't work. And so now we have no choice. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. All right, I'll say a quick thing about Denmark, because, you know, you guys know if there's one thing I'm an expert on, it's Denmark. But we did an episode on Denmark, so that means I know more than Paul Krugman knows about Denmark. He made a passing reference to Denmark, and it turns out when you look closely at Denmark, you learn a few things. First of all, Denmark's actually very, very high. It may even be one slot higher than the U.S. in economic freedom. Ooh, that's a little inconvenient. So it turns out their, their corporate income tax is lower. They, they're in terms of legal system, property rights, sound money, openness to international trade, better than the U.S. And on all counts. So... You know, you could at least debate, it's at least debatable that these factors might have a teensy-weensy bit to do with if it does well. But then also, the New York Times, which is a newspaper that ought to be familiar to Krugman, did a story on the welfare state in Denmark not long ago and showed that the government of Denmark is desperately trying to wean people off government support. Uh, so they've, they've cut unemployment benefits, like the amount of time you can be on them, in half, because they don't know what to do. They've got... 9% of the potential labor force, 9% gets lifetime disability. I mean, that, it's just an astro astronomical figure. So they're, again, they're looking with greater scrutiny uh, at that. Only three out of the 98 municipalities in Denmark have a majority of residents working. That's a result of both disincentives to work and the aging of the population. And the aging of the population, in turn, is, uh, is uh, egged on by the welfare state because the more extensive welfare state you have, the less need there is for children. You don't need children to look after you in your old age. Uh, other people's children will look after you in, in your old age through taxes. And so children become simply a financial burden rather than a benefit. And I know you're thinking, but nobody thinks that way when they sit down and have children. Yeah, you would think they wouldn't. But as it turns out, in the same way that it is true that single motherhood was encouraged by subsidizing it, when you subsidize something, you do generally tend to get more of it. I, I could have said something about there being only one Contra Cruz, but I think I don't want to try the patience of a brand new audience, so we're just, we're just going to leave that there. Uh, Bob, I'm looking, I'm looking at, our, at our time, and I think we're getting close up to it. In fact, I think we're slightly over it. So l let me say, just say a quick, quick little thing here, not directly related to this column, but Krugman has this smug, s superior kind of attitude in his columns that ugh, he can't believe all the stupid heads he has to deal with who don't, don't understand basic logic and basic economics and so on and so forth, and they don't understand the empirical evidence is all on his side. And in a recent episode, Bob was really carrying his weight on this episode. He pointed out that it, there are only two cases where when you ask the Keynesians, look, give us a case 
of government spending was increased dramatically, and that got the economy out of a depression. And they, they'll say, well, the 1930s and, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis. All right, but the 1930s, the, uh, it was still double-digit unemployment the whole decade. So you follow up with them. You say, well, what's that about? And they say, well, think of how much worse it would have been if we hadn't done all that government spending. <laughs> that is the Krugman answer. And likewise, we've had this very anemic recovery from 2008, and his response is, well, think of how much worse it would have been. And so I, was, I thought, how am I going to, I have four of, the Woods, four of the Woods girls are here, actually, and four of my daughters are here today. <laughs> and, and today, I, I was trying to think, how would I convey this point to them? So, I, Bob, I used your analogy, the, the medicine analogy. I mean, suppose there was some cancer treatment, let's say. And every time you gave this cancer treatment to somebody, the cancer remained. Nothing happened to the cancer. It was totally unaffected. But I insisted to you that it was a cancer cure, even though I could show you no evidence of this. There were no people who had been cured by can of cancer by this medicine. But every time I administered it to somebody, I said, well, think of how much worse your cancer would have gotten if you hadn't taken this medicine. You would know this guy's a quack. <laughs> well, guess which quack it is our privilege to refute every single week. You're looking at his big fat head right here on the screen. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to Contra Krugman. Subscribe to the show for free on iTunes or Stitcher at ContraKrugman.com. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, our blog, books by Tom and Bob, and more at ContraKrugman.com. See you next week. Okay, well, thanks to everybody for this. When I first went to the Mises University summer program that Jeff mentioned and we've been talking about, all the way back in 1993, I went to the Mises University program. Now, I was just learning this stuff, and when you're just learning this stuff, and you go to Mises University, and it's all these faculty members, and they're all hardcore, it really knocked my socks off. I, wasn't, I, I was the most free market guy I knew. And then compared to these people, I thought, I'm like a pinko commie compared to these people. <laughs> Gave me a lot to think about. I'll never forget, I had the opportunity several times to meet Murray Rothbard. He was a faculty member at Mises University. And it was just tremendous. And everybody followed him around. And uh, it was an inc just an incredible experience. Because he, he was kind and gracious and decent and encouraging. And everybody loved him and admired him so much. And yet none of it ever went to his head. He was just so regular and normal and approachable. Like you could just talk to him on and on and you never got the sense that I'm some crummy undergraduate and he's Murray Rothbard and I'm wasting his time. You never got that feeling. And I remember there was a time when, you know, Rothbard, he'd be listening to you and he'd, he'd be doing this while he was listening. And you'd look at the crowd and as time went on, the kids didn't even realize they were doing it. They were all kind of sitting here <laughs> like, like Rothbard, <laughs> just, just totally crazy. All right. Well, this, you know, this wasn't just something that benefited me because I was intellectually curious, although it did. It also had real practical consequences for me. After the 2008 financial crisis, I thought Ron Paul should write a book on what caused the financial crisis. Because I thought, who has more credibility on this than a guy who, in 2001, on the House floor, said, these jerks just blew up a tech bubble, and now we're suffering through the wreckage of that, and now they're going to replace it with a housing bubble. He said that in 2001. I mean, the guy can predict the future. <laughs> he should write this book. So I, I'll just tell you right now, I just came flat out and told him, you should write this book. Now is the time. And he says, yeah, but I've already written so much on it, I have nothing else to say. And I said, that's what makes it easy. <laughs> Just collect all your speeches and make a book. I mean, come on, right? And make it focused on the financial crisis. Write one extra chapter and the book is done. Eh, he didn't want to do it. So I said, all right, look, somebody's doing it. Because if, if there's no Austrian response, then Paul Krugman wins by default. The terrorists have won. I will not let that happen. So I said to Dr. Paul, if I wrote such a book, would you write could I basically guilt you into writing the foreword at least? Which he did. Score. Okay. So in 2009, I had a book come out called Meltdown, 
on the financial crisis, and it gave a non-Keynesian explanation, and it was the first book to come out on the financial crisis that included a discussion of the bailouts, the first one out. And that was because my publisher said, everybody in the world is going to write a book like this, and they're going to be better known than you, so the only way yours is going to be noticed is if you're the first one. So I had to write that book in one month. Oh, oh yeah, it was horrifying. It was the worst month of my life. It was terrible. I hated every minute of it. Horrible. But how could I have done that in one month if I hadn't been trained by the Mises Institute? Where, where would I have gotten the knowledge from? But it was from the Institute, from all the stuff I learned, all the books I was turned on to. Like, I was able to sit down with Murray Rothbard and say, you know, I want to know more about how the Eisenhower people stole the 52 nomination from Taft. What should I read? Boom. He says, you should read The 20-Year Revolution by Chesley Manley. No one's ever read that book. I went to the library. That's one good thing. I was at a, a really good undergrad school. Our library had every book in the world, and nobody at this left-wing school was taking any of those books out, right? I could get, I could get Chesley Manley ten times over if I wanted, right? I could roll around in Chesley Manley, no problem. But in other words, I was able to get recommendations right from him, and then from all the people who have succeeded him at the Mises Institute. What an experience, and this, it made this possible. And I did a lot of media. I remember I got people, though, saying, hey, you know, we never thought about this. We never really thought about the Fed. You really made us think. But aren't you throwing out the baby with the bathwater, right? I mean, couldn't we just reform the Fed, make it work better? And I said, well, you do throw out the baby with the bathwater when it's a demon baby. <laughs> oh, what a glorious moment. I'd been just waiting for that opportunity, for that, that baby to come out. And now, we, and now Bob and I... And Bob also um, went to the Mises University. He was a fellow at the Mises Institute, as I was in the 1990s. Now, every week for free, Bob and I are going out there and doing this refutation of Paul Krugman. And it's just, it's an incredible time that we live in. That, yeah, okay, Krugman has a bigger audience than we do. That is true. But it is a little bit of a David and Goliath story now, because thanks to technology, and frankly, thanks to what I learned from the Mises Institute, I'm able to do what, you know, what one or two people can to fight back, to get an alternative out there. And I, I want to say one other quick uh, Mises Institute thing. Actually, let me hold off on the Mises Institute. I want to say a quick Bernie Sanders thing. I don't want to be the only one who doesn't mention Bernie Sanders. All right. We all know Bernie Sanders is all wrong, and he has a lot of fans. So what I'm going to, I'm going to give you a gift right now, because I have a book called Bernie Sanders is Wrong, and I'm going to give it to you for free. It's an e-book. Now, e-book, you think, oh, I know what this is. It's 15 triple-spaced pages. No, no, no. This is a full-length book, and everything Bernie is wrong on, we have a chapter on it, okay? It's called Bernie Sanders is Wrong. You can get it by taking out your smartphone, and you got a text. You're going to send a text to the number 33444. You text the name Bernie to 33444. Yeah, that's right. I nailed Bernie's name for this thing before Bernie even knew what hit him. Bernie to 33444, and you'll get Bernie Sanders is wrong. Now, that's a miracle, right? That's a miracle that I get to stand up here and do that. Now, you get all this great knowledge. You can go out and drive people in Seattle crazy. But the last thing I want to say about the Mises Institute is I have had, I've been around the libertarian world for quite a while now, and I know all the different think tanks and the foundations and who sides with whom and who's quarreling with whom, and I, I know the whole thing. I know all the names. I know the good guys, the bad guys. I know it all. And I will tell you, there are a lot of people asking you for money who are going to spend it on chauffeurs. I'm telling you that's the case. I know there are foundations that exist for the sake of existing, for the sake of raising money, for the sake of existing still longer. And that's why they're there. The Mises Institute is nothing like that. It runs on a shoestring, and it runs extremely efficiently, and it goes right between the eyes of the establishment. There's no liber liber I call them libertarian light. There's no libertarian light mush. There's no inviting the Fed chairman over for a cocktail party. There's none of that. It's hand grenades everywhere. <laughs> if you want to help out a bunch of lapdogs who say they're libertarians and say they're Austrians, 
be my guest. But if you want to help out the best, the foremost institution when it comes to liberty and Austrian economics, there is no choice, and I strongly urge you. They didn't even ask me to do this. I earn no salary for the Mises Institute, but I strongly urge you to become a member of the Mises Institute today because it's not something that just Bob Murphy and I can do or Peter Schiff or Jeff Deist or Lou Rockwell. We have to all be in this together. We're totally outnumbered, so we have to bundle our resources and use them as efficiently as possible, and I've never seen anything more efficient and effective and an institution that I could possibly be prouder to be associated with than the Mises Institute. So do please join us, and thanks for coming today. Well, before we adjourn, I want to say Tom mentioned that the Mises Institute changed the trajectory of his life. You know, he has two Ivy League degrees, yeah, it changed the trajectory of his life. If you'd just stuck with the program, you'd be rich now, like Krugman. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> My God. He mentioned joining us. Anyone who would like to join us today, we have this beautiful new silver coin, a one-out silver coin with Mises on the front and uh, our logo on the back. It's, it's, an, it's uh, an absolutely beautiful little item, and someday it may be worth w well more than the $60 you'll spend for joining us. But I just have two quick messages before we adjourn. The first is that Lou Rockwell, our founder, would love to have been here today and, and was planning on being here today. Um, all I'm going to say is he is a victim of TSA and an unhappy one at that, but we're thinking of him and, and uh, we appreciate uh, that he would like to have been with us here today. So a round of applause for our founder, Lou. He might be listening. And last, before we adjourn, I would like to personally thank and, and collectively thank Harvey Allison and his family for sponsoring us today, especially this beautiful venue. So thank you so much to the Harvey Allison family. Thank you to Town Hall. See you next week. <laughs>